All right, and we are recording. So Jason, we have a, a special guest with us this week. Um, so joining us is, is Rick Hall. Uh, Rick is a software entrepreneur focused on the analytics market. He has been working in analytics and software for 30 years uh, and has led the development of over a dozen software products and taken several companies from early stage to, to eventual sale. Uh, most recently, Rick has led a group uh, in the purchase of Agenity uh, back in March of, of last year and is currently serving as CEO. Um, so Agenity was an early innovator in analytics management, and uh, they launched Agenity Pro earlier this year. So Rick, just a quick brief intro to, 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 to kind of get the, the conversation going, but uh, I guess to start us off, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and uh, what uh, what you're currently up to? Yeah, you bet. So, you know, kind of first thing is I, I, I'm going to have to stop using this 30 years thing, right? Because that's, uh, you know, it's a scary amount of time, right? But I've been doing analytics since kind of right out of college, perhaps by accident, which I think is how a lot of people kind of got into it is that uh, I was working for a small software consulting firm and the problems that they were solving were initially kind of reporting problems. And those reporting problems turned into how do you build you know, bigger systems that became data warehousing and, uh, uh, you know, kind of went from there. We worked in telecom and we were kind of solving these problems around, you know, kind of churn with customers. Uh, and that got me really interested in how, uh, how modeling could, you know, kind of improve decisions. Um, and kind of from there went to uh, uh, a company that was sold and then eventually started a company called G4 Analytics with this idea of embedding insights through analytics into business process that would empower decision makers. So not make decisions of their own, but empower others. And we started out working in consumer goods and focused on kind of pricing and promotion, which is a, you know, kind of a big complex uh, problem. Uh, sold that to Nielsen in 2012 and stayed there for five years and ran a whole bunch of analytics there. And, went to be a CTO and really kind of enjoyed it. But uh, it was some of the innovation ideas that I had that took me to form Karen Corporation and ultimately to buy Agenity last year. And so kind of back in the early stage uh, world and kind of trying to solve uh, problems with analytics, kind of what I would say at scale or the last mile of how you get analytics out into the organization. And, you know, kind of it's fun to uh, to be back in in that mode. That is awesome. Um, and I, I share a similar story, I think, stumbling my way into analytics. I started off as a software engineer. I was fired in about 2005 and ended up at Omniture, uh, kind of early stage, um, long before the, the Adobe acquisition of, of Omniture. So, we all seem to have some of those stories where we just accidentally fell into to analytics. But I think looking back on it, both my job as a, a software engineer and even back into college, I, I seem to have a, an affinity for analytics, even even though I probably didn't fully understand what it was that that field meant until I, I stumbled into it. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in hearing your take on and um, uh, for one, I'd love to hear kind of where your software is is being positioned within the the business. We we typically tend to work with uh, digital organizations within large brands, so it's heavy marketers and looking at um, behavior on websites and mobile apps. That's that tends to be where we play. But I one of the interesting things is we think we own all of analytics and that's the whole analytics bubble. And it's just such a tiny portion of it. And we're often amazed to see that these organizations have massive organizations or massive analytics teams that, that don't overlap. But my question and where I kind of want to start off is one of the things that we've been thinking about this year is this concept of sustainable analytics. And um, we've been looking at it from a lot of different angles. And one is from a tool set perspective. Yeah. And we'd love to get your impression of what you see in your industry as you're, you're probably faced with this challenge because you're selling software. But when I started in the industry, um, there were only a handful of analytics players um, on the market. Um, but now it's, it's not uncommon for these big companies we work with just within the digital space, measuring marketing effectiveness, have 10, 15 different analytics platforms sure. that they're trying to deploy. And there's probably hundreds of more, if not thousands on the market that they can choose from. How do we 
how do you kind of stand out from that noise and how do businesses kind of fight the fatigue of, yeah. of tool overload? Yeah. So, I mean, it's an interesting problem, right? So, you know, I think back, you know, kind of maybe when we all started in this space, you know, kind of analytics was this kind of, it became a centralized function, right? So this is kind of this corporate data warehouse model, and we're going to put all the data in that. We're going to figure out exactly what we need to do in advance, and we're going to buy the capacity associated with that, and then we're going to solve that problem, and then the world would be better, right? And, you know, a lot of problems got solved that way, but, you know, organizations are changing so frequently, right? Business is changing all the time. They're acquiring new companies or you know, things like crazy things like COVID come along and suddenly there's this whole need for a whole different data set that completely blows up your uh, models that all were neat and predicted what would happen before that existed, right? So I think that the challenge with analytics today is that, uh, first of all, we need analytics everywhere. So at every, you know, kind of edge of the business and we need to keep up with the pace of change of business. And I think that what, I've seen that drive is that, you know, these centralized efforts on, you know, even the best implementation of a centralized analytic, you know, kind of initiative takes months uh, to implement, oftentimes, you know, years, right? If we're honest about it. And uh, that's not fast enough. So we need things that will work faster. And I think that the key to working faster is going to be to leverage uh, smart people in the business, you know, kind of, we call them business analysts or data analysts and, you know, kind of there, but the, the person in, you know, in sales who, uh, grew up, uh, playing around with computers, right. And was good with Excel. And then they got hired out of college to be on the sales team. And, uh, you know, the head of sales figured out this person is pretty good with Excel and data. And, uh, you know, they got, they got stuck in this, uh, role of being the person who churned all the data because the corporate systems couldn't keep up, right? So, uh, I mean, that's kind of where we fit, first of all, is we fit in this kind of intersection of the the business analyst, the non-technical user, and the technical team, because technical teams can't scale to the size of the problem that exists in organizations today. Um, and uh, we have to find a way to empower people in the business to let analytics evolve uh, as opposed to be centrally engineered. Um, and uh, I think that's, you know, it's a huge problem and kind of a fun one to try to tackle. As, as part of that, I'm wondering, um, do, do you see a, I, I guess when you, when you talk with customers, who are you talking with? It, 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 you it sound like you're straddling this divide. Like what, what does your customer look like and where do they roll up in the organization? I'll let you answer that. And then I have a, a reason for asking it that I'll follow up. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question, right? So uh, we straddle both. You, you got that right. So we straddle people in the business and the analytics team. We have, we have a, a freemium land and expand model. So we have a very inexpensive tool that you can start out with. You can practically use it for free uh, and then switch over to paying for it as you uh, expand it, which is called the Genie Pro. Um, and then we have a, a bigger product, which is Genie Premium, which is designed to do more. But the, the basis of that free tooling, free land and expand is we're after the user directly. So sometimes that's an analytic engineer right, who's got to build complicated problems. And sometimes it's a business analyst who's either trying to use the work of the engineer or do their own stuff. And we kind of stumbled upon this realization. In fact, I kind of stumbled upon it when I formed Karen and Agenity was on the same problem. And that's kind of what led us to this is that Agenity had this free tooling idea. Uh, and uh, as they look at their users, they find 60% of their users were actually people in the business, business analysts. Um, and like 25% were engineers. And the engineers are the hardcore users, for sure, right? Um, but there's this big group out there that's trying to do some analytics themselves. And, uh, you know, so we kind of seized on that and said, look, we're going to create tooling that lets these two groups work together. Because really most software out there is trying to address one group or the other. And in fact, I don't think you could succeed without them both and without them being able to work together. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it for us. Um, because we're kind of, you know, uh, inexpensive user land and expand, we focus on the user first. 
Uh, but we are trying to talk to, and we're increasingly finding that this message of collaborative analytics, uh, you know, resonates with like the CIO, the chief data officer, um, because they're like stuck with this demand that just massively outstrips their ability to deliver, right? There's no way they can do all the analytics that they're, uh, the business teams are demanding, um, even if they have big teams. Uh, so, you know, finding a way to empower the end user, but not leave their, their central highly skilled analytic teams out of the equation uh, is, uh, you know, kind of a message that we think resonates. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And you hit on something that we, we've been finding as, as a challenge is that really every, every facet of an organization has some kind of analytic need, like everybody needs insights yeah. and, and data. And over the last decade, it seems like the goal has been to, to make that more ubiquitous and make it more self-serving so, so people can access data. Um, but that has also come with its challenges from a, a business standpoint. And how do you ensure kind of centralized data accuracy? And it sounds like a lot of your users maybe roll up through a CIO. It's interesting, a lot of the, the users, business users that we work with roll up through the CMO. Yeah. Um, but do you see that and how important is it to have someone at somewhere in the organization that's ultimately the one responsible? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And I, I think we've only probably got part of the answer if I'm realistic about it. So uh, first of all, our users roll up both to the central analytics team and to the business, right? So those analysts are rolling up in the business in all kinds of different business functions. So certainly in marketing in some cases or sales or, you know, depends on the the business model of our of our customer, but the central analytic teams often you know roll up to uh, to to IT. In the you know kind of when, when when certainly when I started in the business, you know we had this idea that we're going to build the central data model. You know, and kind of like we're going to have a data steward that is going to define the data architecture of the entire business, and it's going to all be kind of neat and organized and uh, you know kind of uh, consistent, right? And uh, I mean, let's just be honest, that never worked, it never has worked. And it's it's certainly never going to work the way that we, you know, kind of idealized it, right? For some of the same reasons, you couldn't possibly keep up uh, with changing business and the complexity is just too high for, you know, for a, a person who's not part of the business to understand. Like I'm sure in the kind of marketing analytics that you guys do, you know, the nuances, those models are pretty complex, right? And if you don't have domain expertise, uh, in some cases, you, you can't possibly, you know, kind of build and define the model. And if you're going to teach somebody that who's in some central function who doesn't come from your domain, okay, great, but that's going to take a lot of time and effort and, you know, it's just never going to work out. So what I think we have to move away from is what I'll call an engineering paradigm, which says we're going to define it all up front to a biologic biology paradigm where we're going to have analytics evolve in the business and then we need to find a way to curate those analytics to find the accurate analytics and promote them to you know take over which is kind of like why i so much kind of like the biology model we need the the analytics to evolve naturally um you know through mutation uh and uh, uh, and then we need the right ones to succeed, right? And uh, uh, you know, I was talking to a, a, a chief analytics officer just the other day, and he's like, "I got these data architects, right?" And they all grew up, you know, kind of with the central model kind of training, right? And we were talking. I said, "You know, look, I think you got to teach them to curate." Uh, and I think that that's going to become the key role is curation um, because you can't possibly, you know, kind of uh, define it all yourself. I don't know if that is that resonating. Yeah, no, I, yeah. And I like that. I like that um, visual of this biology kind of survival of the fittest, like the, the, the stuff that works survives in that scenario. How do you keep the stuff that shouldn't survive from doing damage to, to a business? It's, Again, it's one of the challenges I think we face where we have this desire to drive widespread user adoption. Yeah. But to your point, if you don't have deep domain expertise, you, you could be drawing really invalid conclusions. And, and even 
of the most simplest things that we may think as simple as, you know, we're, we're going to call a segment of our customers first time buyers. And someone over here on the other side of the aisle could have a completely different definition for that. They're quoting sure. it to the public, the CEO, and, yeah. it, and it conflicts with what we're saying. How do we keep that from damaging the business while we're allowing the other stuff? Yeah. To well, so uh, no easy answer to that, right? I don't think I have the silver bullet. Unfortunately, we'd all be rich if we yeah. had it together, right? But the... Uh, you know, I mean, I first of all, I think you're absolutely right. There's this problem of the what are the good ones, the balance, you know, on, uh, you know, talking to a, a big retailer recently uh, who said uh, they had 35 different ways to measure coupon count. Right. Like, OK, I mean, coupon count doesn't sound like that's that all that complicated. Right. How do you have 35 different ways to measure it um, now? Uh, I don't know if 34 of them are wrong. Or, you know, maybe there's five different contexts that the count, in fact, really does need to be different. But, you know, figuring that out is uh, is really, you know, kind of difficult. So um, I think that, you know, you've got to, you know, I do. I like this idea of curation um, that, you know, you need your data architects to become curators. They need to be able to understand the differences and, you know, kind of get at them. I think that if we have tooling that allows, uh, you know, kind of these different roles to kind of collaborate around a common architecture. There's also some some uh, benefits there, right? And uh, uh, because so much of the stuff that when you get these differences, they evolved in these systems that nobody can possibly trace how they came up with the answers they came up with, right? Like half of the stuff is done in Excel, right? And it's some personal productivity tool that nobody knows where they got to the answer. Um, you know, uh, uh, or whatnot, right? So I think that there's this interesting thing going on with these new data platforms, so like Snowflake or Redshift or, you know, because it used to be we had to buy those platforms, buy a data warehousing platform with a certain capacity in mind, right? And, you know, that capacity was based on some predefined set of workloads. Um, and as soon as a workload came along, that we didn't plan for, then we, you know, pushed them away. You know, we weren't going to let, you know, some user group, like if you're working for the CMO and the CMO has some new data set, you know, we're not going to let the CMO ingest his data set into our corporate data warehouse. Forget about it, right? Um, because we bought capacity for the problems we understood, right? So I think that proliferated pushing these systems further and further apart, right? Because the central systems couldn't handle the different unanticipated workloads. And I think that these new platforms, because they're super scalable uh, and because they're highly elastic, you know, they have the ability to let the business teams ingest their own data into the common platform and to create some commonality that you can create, uh, you know, kind of consistency against. So I think we have a better opportunity there but I think there's a mind shift difference to curation also. And I think yeah. there's some combination of those things. I don't know. What do you think? No, I, 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 I wish I had the, the answer for that. I, I don't know. Um, and it's something that in our small world, again, looking at these organizations, the analytics power and muscle is, is huge. And we're just working with a small sliver within kind of the marketing functions. And even within, even within that, it's so incredibly difficult for us to figure out any kind of consistency. And I want to go back to your coupon example, because I, we've seen it with our customers where that has popped up, where different people in the organization are in I don't want to say inventing data, but inventing different ways to look at the data in a, in a way that it benefits them. Yeah. If that makes sense. Sure. Uh, so if, I, if I'm getting a bonus or I'm getting paid or I'm getting promotions based on certain activities, I want to kind of shift how we view that data. And we've seen that in a lot of our customers where we go in there and something as simple as to your point, coupon, like an add to cart, like how many people are adding to cart? I'm like, why do we have eight different ways to measure this? Well, yeah. there are multiple teams that are getting comped on performance and they've kind of taken their own view of the, of the metric. So I, I wanted to ask you, how important do you think it is to have kind of an independent voice within organizations to not necessarily be tied to performance that can then sit down and, not necessarily call BS, but provide a different perspective. And the reason I ask it is I had a, a boss very early on in my career who I went to and I was very defeated one day because the, 
the uh, VP of marketing just gave me a tongue lashing and about made me curl up in the corner and cry. And, and, and I'm like, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. He's like, dude, he's like, if you're going to be an analyst, you got to be prepared to piss people off. And if I'm not having people come in saying, Jason's making me mad, then you're not doing your job because yeah. I expect you to be the independent voice and not go out and try to prove them wrong. But I don't want you to have anything to prove. Just tell me what the data is saying. So how important is that within organizations? Again, especially if we're we're, we're driving adoption and we have this kind of curated model where we have lots of data, but we're still leaving it into the hands of people to draw their own conclusions and view of the data. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, motives are a really tricky thing, right? You know, I can't believe I'm going to kind of go to Einstein, right? But you know, <laughs> as soon as you go to observe something, you change it, right? So, uh, you know, kind of, I think that there's a, there's a, fundamental there that when you, you know, start tying people's success to how you're measuring it, then you almost have to uh, create some level of independence uh, to that exercise, right? We, you know, we talk about that in, you know, the world of things like government and, you know, kind of regulation all the time, right? You need an independent arbiter to uh, do things that you're incentivized to otherwise, uh, you know, kind of muck up. Um, I don't know that most organizations kind of, you know, do that. And I think that a lot of times, uh, you know, the analytics is controlled by the people who are, you know, kind of uh, uh, getting rewarded on it. But I think there are so many other problems with these, you know, this complexity that I would say people's motivation to do the right thing on my hierarchy of problems, I don't put that like at the top. I put, I think most of the time people's motives are okay and, and actually pretty good. But I think that the complexity of this architecture and where you got the data from is a, you know, yeah. is a bigger problem. Right? It, for sure it is. I mean, that, that is a real, real challenge. And I, I probably should not be as, as harsh on that, but I, I have been frustrated with, with the motives and, and it's really been more external. Um, yeah. Some of these companies that we work with, I go in and we, we audit and, and help them understand their landscape. And one of the things I call out more often than not, is I said, you have an ad agency in here that is getting paid on their performance. And then they're also yeah. collecting the data and analyzing the data. I'm not saying they're going to do anything weird, but yeah. it, it would be really hard not to have that. You have your, full control right there to yeah. kind of fudge the numbers in your favor. So Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, so it reminds me of the story, right? So uh, I had a company, G4 Analytics, I sold to Nielsen, right? And, uh, you know, at Nielsen, I had this promotional analytics responsibility, uh, you know, kind of globally, and we were trying to predict and, and model promotions, right? And so one of the things that we did, and it took us about two years to do it, um, is we built a model, a benchmark of promotional performance across, like we were looking at, 200 million promotions, right? And these are these are not you know marketing promotions, but they're in-store trade promotions, like so display, feature, price discounts, shelf kind of things. Um, and uh, uh, because Nielsen had all the retail data and we're able to pull together the observational data to look at these analytics, we look at 200 million promotions, right? Across 20 countries over a two year period. And you know we came back with the analytics that said, okay, 80% of promotions lose money for the retailer, the manufacturer, or both, right? Um, and it's across like every category and every uh, product. Um, yes, there are winning promotions, but for the most part, these promotions are, are really not working, right? And we produced this benchmark and we did a bunch of work with it. And, you know, well, I left Nielsen and guess where that benchmark is? it doesn't exist anymore, right? So it's like, you know, like yeah, there's an element of not wanting to tell people, you know, this uh, uh, this bad piece of news, right? Because, you know, that, that they don't want to hear yeah. that this, uh, you know, this critical part to their sales, because in, in that case, and I think this is still true, a lot of consumer goods sales executives, I'm gonna get myself in a lot of trouble here, but- Don't get yourself uh, in trouble. They're yeah. rewarded on how much volume they sell, right? So, if they sell a lot more volume, but they sell it unprofitably, you know, they're still met their sales target, right? So they're they're not incentivized to uh, to you know promote only efficiently. They're incentivized to through sales. So they're you know they're they're addicted to this promotional engine, 
uh, which has become kind of a race to the bottom. So speaking of in-store, um, and I'm not going to bring up the 30-year mark, but I'll say that you've been in the space a long time and have probably seen lots of trends come and go and evolve over time. I'm interested in what your take is on the future of, of retail or in-store analytics because you know, I think you're talking a lot about what historically has been the case, a lot of rolled up data. We look at sales to promotions to and looking at the efficacy of, of those things. But do you think that in-store analytics is going to take a page from digital analytics where you're measuring down to a person visiting a website? Is that feasible? And do you think in the future we'll have more kind of consumer level analytics or is it going to continue to be more at a rolled up level of data? Yeah, so I think, you know, so first off, you know, kind of all the in-store analytic efforts are trying to get as granular as they can, right? So, you know, and they're they're applying all the same math and sophistication, but like it's, you always have this question of path to purchase, right? And, you know, ultimately that gets into what is the marketing function doing uh, and what is the sales function doing and what's happening in-store, you know, kind of you got these very, in some cases, kind of split incentives, right? So, you know, the marketing team wants to claim credit for the sale because they, you know, did some promotion and they got the person to the store or so they think they did, right? Uh, but the, you know, the in-store promotion wants to claim credit because they put something on display, right? Like, oh, okay, how do you puzzle that out? Tricky problem, right? And, you know, I've, I've got a good friend uh, who leads a group at Nielsen that's, that's, he spends his time just trying to solve that problem. Uh, the granularity issue comes down to can you a person identify uh, the uh, the the retail sale right so uh, anybody who's got loyalty card data uh, and you know shopper data Amazon by the way Whole Foods right um, you know there there's a reason why they want you to register right in Prime and there's a reason why they give you extra discounts is they want to make sure that they keep you incentivized enough to self-identify. And once you've self-identified, then they can start to really get at what, you know, works on the basis of, you know, of Jason versus Jim versus Rick in store. Because behaviorally, even if we all, you know, fit in the demographic uh, of uh, uh, old white analytic dude, right, you know, then uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, we might behave very differently, right? Yeah. So, uh it's, uh, but, you know, then you have all the kind of regulations around privacy. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that that's a messy problem. I don't think it's going to stop being messy. I think retailers are going to continue to try to seek uh, as much person identified information as possible. Um, you know, whether it's like, I'm going to pick up your phone when you walk in the store, et cetera. But I think increasingly, you know, Amazon, which is I'm gonna I'm gonna give you enough that you volunteer to identify yourself. Um, I, was, I was gonna ask you about the phone um, yeah. because eight to ten years ago, you know, beacon technology was yeah. super super hot, and the whole idea was we can start to blend online offline together. I always had the thought, oh, that's a great way to track at a phone level. You yeah. bring up privacy, but I, I'm wondering, there's got to be companies out there that are thinking of we all have a unique ID right here at yeah. some level. Can that track where I move through a store and what products I look at? And yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so I've seen a bunch of beacon analytic work done in store and uh, most of it's really not that useful. Right. So, mm. you know, you, they're trying to get at what aisles do people lock down? How much dwell time did they spend in front of certain, you know, things and how does that relate to, uh, you know, kind of how I promoted to that person. And uh, there's too many gaps in the data stream um, for that to really have worked so far. So, you know, I think beacon beacons to identify people is probably becoming, you know, that's been tried and not, you know, kind of didn't really get where it wanted to go. And then you throw in all the privacy stuff that's coming and, you know, kind of the protection that people like Apple are building in the phones. I think that that's, I think it's going to have to be opt in, right? So I think that, you know, person identified uh, needs to be opt in. I think just also ethically, right? If you're in the analytics space, I think, you know, like at least I prefer, I preferred it when I was actually doing those kind of analytics is I want data that people knew they gave me um, and they made a decision as opposed to I just, you know, 
picked up on their phone because they walked by. Yeah, for right. sure. It's yeah, it's something we fight all the time because the, in this space you mentioned, you know, California privacy, GDPR, um, a lot of what we do in the mainstream media and people that don't really understand what it is that we do find what we do in, incredibly creepy. You know, it's like, Oh, you spy on people. And, and so, yeah, I agree. You know, I, I think we, we don't even want to get close to that ethical line of saying we want to do things that are in that, that creepy mode, but I, I get it. People are, are worried and, and privacy is becoming a bigger, bigger issue. Um, I do have one question around privacy and then I'm going to ask Jim, like I can keep talking about analytics for like three or four hours, but I, I, are you okay if we move to some other topics or do you want to keep on this thread either Jim or Rick? If you're I, I'm, you know, I'm good to go wherever. Right. Okay. So, you know, kind of. uh, so on the, on the privacy discussion, it's, it's so quickly evolving and there's so many, there's no centralized privacy. Um, I, I just I don't think any organization is probably 100% compliant when it comes to these regulations. Is sure. is it, you know what are your thoughts on the challenges of that? Are we seeing a rise of maybe there probably already are like chief privacy officers, compliance officers? Um, yeah, there are, there are for sure. But you know, it's, it, but how do we how do we keep up with it? Well, I'm not sure we do. So I was. Uh, uh, you know, kind of I did this stint as a chief uh, chief technology officer for a retail services firm, a couple billion dollar company, um, you know, good, uh, good place to be. And uh, uh, they were funded by a big uh, private equity firm. So they put it in this conference out in Silicon Valley, right? They brought all the chief technology officers for all their companies together. And they brought a lot of these super heavyweights from Silicon Valley to talk to us, right? And they bring in this guy who had been like the chief of security and privacy, you know, at the Pentagon and had been at Google. And, you know, this guy was like the, one of the top people in the, the world. And, you know, he st- gets up in the front of the group. He says like, you know, he says, like, it's, it's a room full of chief technology, chief information officers says, you will be attacked. You will be penetrated. You will be blamed. <laughs> right. It's like, like, so everybody in the room looks at each other and says, oh, that was like really inspiring, you know, news. I'm kind of boiling down a 60 minute, you know, kind of conversation to the three takeaways that everybody in the room got it was like, it's come, they're coming after you. You can't defend yourself and it's going to be your fault. Right. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, I mean, I don't know the, you know, you look at this solar winds hack, right. You know, it's kind of really creepily complicated, right? You know, these guys got into solar winds and got into solar winds development environment, put something inside the product. And then the product got, you know, delivered to customers. And then it was the Trojan horse, right? And so, uh, you know, that puts this incredible, you know, uh, uh, structure on really kind of looking all the way down um, to, uh, to find, security and you know i think privacy is the same thing a lot of these privacy breaches have been because of security holes and so uh you know kind of that's a that's a, it's a tough space but you know kind of so i think you know everybody's got a chief privacy officer chief uh security officer uh they're doing all kinds of compliance work um i think most companies are really trying to do a lot um you know it becomes a bigger and bigger piece of their budget but I think it's also a battle that is like, you know, as soon as you get ahead of it, the other guys, uh, you know, is, is also evolving. So, yeah, yeah, it makes it tough. Um, so I'd love to switch gears a little bit. If my memory is not betraying me, I want to say Jim mentioned that you had a remote aspect to what you're building out with your company. And I would love to, to drill into that a little bit more, not only because it's something we're passionate about, but it's something, yeah all of our listeners and everyone we work with, whether they want to or not, we're all kind of in that remote capacity right now. So we'd love to hear a little bit about your background, why you kind of chose to go that route and and maybe, you know, for me, it goes back to when we founded this company G4, uh, you know, this is back in like 2001. um, The, the, the four guys that founded it, we were all analytics people. We were all advising, you know, kind of Microsoft at the time. But we were all in different places, and we formed this company, and we're, we're, uh, we didn't have very much money. Um, 
we didn't have any money. Uh, let's be very clear about that. And so we all, it all stayed where we were, right? And we started to collaborate remotely and that became a remote company, but, you know, kind of, uh, and, and it was successful in the end, but we could never raise a dime, you know, because the, the VCs are like, okay, you're here, he's there, you know, your development team's over there. Like, and, you know, there's a Silicon Valley, you know, kind of like we all have to be co-located, you know, kind of thing, right? Um, and, uh, you know, then after I left, uh, you know, my, my CTO job um, and uh, started, uh, I did some consulting for a while and I, I was doing some consulting in Silicon Valley and I was working with this venture backed company um, and, uh, uh, and they're flying me to California from Washington. I lived in DC at the time. Every week they're flying me out to Silicon Valley. They're, you know, they're paying like 500 bucks a night for me to stay in a hotel, right? Um, and uh, and this is not like, you know, the Ritz, right? This is like a creepy, uh, you know, like a uh, uh, hotel in, in uh, on 101 in Silicon Valley and uh, uh, paying a fortune for me to come out there. And, and these guys are hiring engineers out of college, right? Right out of college at $280,000 a year. Um, in Silicon Valley. And, and if you make $280,000 a year in Silicon Valley and your spouse also makes $280,000 in Silicon Valley, this is at the time, I think it's starting to change a little bit. You can about afford to buy a house. Right. Uh, and, uh, so, you know, so I'm like, look guys, we can use engineers in these other places. And, you know, kind of at first the, the, the CEO is like, yeah, this is really cool. But then he went to talk to his VCs and they were like, no, you got to all be co-located. Right. So, I think there's a whole thing about VCs. They're this tribe. They think they're the great innovators, but they really follow each other in a tribe and, you know, kind of in a way too. That's going to get my in trouble too. But the, uh, Don't worry, I've been blocked by several VCs on Twitter. So yeah, right. Good. Yeah. So the, uh, um, so, uh, they want to, when we bought, uh, Agenity, we bought Agenity on March 10th of last year. Right. So like the world went into lockdown four days later. I had a big plan to bring all the executives of my company and them together uh, and have a big meeting. And that was kibosh, right? So here we are, you know, almost a year later, and my management team has literally never been in the same room together. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and we've, by the way, we've doubled the size of our team. Uh, and uh, we're all working remotely. Um, and we're about to double, we're going to double again this year. Um, and we've completely adopted this remote working model um, and it's working great for us. I mean, there are clearly times when we would really like to be together um, and we're going to need to do that when we can, right? Uh, you know, you got to kind of uh, break a beer open, you know, and kind of sit and chat with people sometimes. Uh, but, you know, kind of it's, it's worked remarkably well for us. And I think, you know, way better than what we anticipated. Cause at the time, you know, back in March, like you didn't know how long it was going to last. We're like, okay, we have to have some way to cobble this together that will exist. And, uh, you know, we are way beyond cobbling and we're to a point where it's just like, you know, kind of, I, I don't think my team would, would want to do it differently at this point. Right. Uh, sure. I, I love hearing that. I mean, it, it proves what we we believe and we know works as well. And I we you know we kind of hear the same things is that you can't collaborate, you can't innovate, you can't do any of these things. You all have to be co located, and you should be co located in Silicon Valley because that's where all the smartest people are. I'm like, there's smart people everywhere, you know. And, and and we want, and that's when we started the company. I'm like, I just want to hire smart people wherever they are, and right. not have to worry about everyone in one location. Jim, have we ever met in person? We have never been in the same room together. Yeah. Five and a half years, and we haven't. And right. and we tried. Uh, we we like to get together once a year in Vegas, and we were going to make it happen. And then Jim's wife had a baby right around that time, so it didn't happen. But man, we we have good collaboration and communication. And and I agree. Yeah, and you know, I love our time together. I love going out and visiting with our customers and clients. Um, but there's no need for us to do that that full time. And in fact, I I can never see myself going back to a situation where I don't have the autonomy autonomy and flexibility yeah. that I have. You know? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, this has been a terrible year for the world, right? But, you know, like, I mean, one, you know, if I wanted to look at some silver lining is this recognition of how powerful, you know, video, uh, you know, based, uh, 
communication really is, right? And you know the, you know I think of all the years that I was uh, getting on planes and going to see customers and you know either to make a sales call or you know talk to them or whatever, right? You know, and I got a couple million miles of airline, you know, miles doing that, and uh, uh, you know. Of course, now the customers wouldn't allow you in the building anyways, right? So they don't want to see you physically, uh, but they're they're just as you know we're they're buying as much stuff from us. They're implementing it successfully. We're helping them. It's all working, right? And it's like it's so much more efficient, right? You know, like uh, I'm I'm with you. If I never have to get up at four thirty to make a seven thirty flight to make a nine o'clock meeting, you know, to be there till four in the afternoon to go out to dinner to get to my hotel room at 8, 9 30 at night like i mean i think there are a lot of people who can identify with having had to do that for years right yeah. and yeah. if i never have to do that again uh you know i'm i'm all for it in fact you know i'm probably like you like if somebody said that's what you're gonna do i'd be like yeah no i don't think so i'm i'm just not gonna go back to that and and that's my hope is that a lot of these companies um this has forced them into a new paradigm even if temporarily i'm hoping the silver lining is that it they're going to give a little bit more opportunity to a different way of working um i I have no belief that there's never going to be offices. People are going to go back in the office, but I'm hoping it's going to be different and the employees where it's feasible are going to have more flexibility and again, autonomy to work at different places. I, I have absolutely loved it. And from a customer perspective, I hope that that also changes the kind of sales mindset. Cause I I'm with you like a couple of years ago, I remember a very poignant story. Uh, one of our vendors that we work with called me up at, I can't remember seven or eight at night and said, Hey, can you jump on a flight at six in the morning to go down to San Diego for a meeting at nine 30, we're going to do lunch and then you can fly back out. I'm like, there's no way Like, for what well, I'm going to do all that for a one hour meeting. Like I can sell this over video <laughs> and, yeah. and we did, you know? And so uh, again, I, I think there's a time and a place for in person, but everything as a default, having to fly somewhere and be somewhere in person, it's just, it's a lot to maintain. And I think it made a lot of people really miserable, but we did it because that's yeah. what we had to do. That's what we were expected to do. Right. And, yeah. you know, it's terribly inefficient, like the cost, you know, kind of of all that, like for that one hour meeting, you know, God, that's a $2,000 expense probably um, outside of the, like the wear and tear on your body from, you know, going through it all. Right. And your family, um, it's uh, you know, it's definitely uh, yeah. I'm with you. I think that you know, kind of like if I'm an idealist, and I kind of am, you know, I actually think that this can do uh, a lot of things to take our you know, kind of very coastal innovation, you know, information cultures, and you know, push it out. Like if you happen to you know like uh, horses, uh, and you want to live on a you know, kind of a horse. Uh, ranch, you know, in wherever Wyoming, um, but you happen to be really cool, passionate software engineer, uh, you know, what if you can do that, right? And yeah. you should be able to do that. And, and how good is that for, you know, the little town that you're going to now live in, that's been devastated over years of like, you know, kind of, you know, depopulation, uh, you know, I think that there's, there is a silver lining there. Um, yeah if we can grab it. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because we've been seeing some movement here in Utah. I'm wondering if you're seeing something similar in Colorado where um, it, it is a very valid concern of our government. Um, so in Utah, we have the Wasatch Front from kind of Ogden to Provo that runs down I-15 and that's where our population is. Sure. So we have all these little other centers all over the place and typically they're fueled by gas, coal, um, more blue collar industries in these towns are dying and drying up. And it's one of the things that our new governor um, is looking into is how do we open up the possibility for people leaving California that want to get out of New York, that want that rural lifestyle, but still want to work in, in technology? How do we how do we retrain the people that have been let go from the oil fields? Um, so we're seeing initiatives like like that trying to get put in place. I think it's probably incredibly difficult. Um, I, I see them doing the uh, kind of ground laying of running fiber just for high speed internet because yeah. you know they just don't have the, the capacity to do it. But do you see something similar happening? And do you think that oh, is yeah. you know you're a, you're an op opportunistic like how how does that happen? Is it something you think? Well, can happen? You, you know, so so I I think it's going to happen. 
right? You know, and I think it's a really good thing that's going to happen. And I think it can, you know, make our world a little bit more integrated uh, than as divided as it may be. But I think that like I'm in Steamboat, Colorado and okay, it's a mountain town and, you know, it's a pretty nice place to be. Right. But, you know, Colorado is, is, uh, is booming and yes, it's still on the front range, but it's also in these small towns in the Western part of the state um, and starting with the mountain towns, but, you know, even, like there's a couple satellite towns outside of Steamboat that, you know, they're, they're also starting to, you know, kind of see it. Um, you got to get high speed, you know, internet to make it work. Right. But not only do you have the laying of fiber, which is happening, right. But, you know, look at what, you know, Musk is doing with Starlink. Right. So, you know, he's putting up 60 satellites a month, right. He's got, I think about 900 of them up there now. And he's going to have, you know, like 10,000, uh, you know, his, his current permission is like 40,000. And like, whether, whether you like Musk or not, you know, kind of look, if we can create a constellation of, you know, high speed internet that is, let's just say global in reach, right? I think that just, you know, that that's, that has, that's going to create a lot of uh, change and a lot of possibilities that didn't exist before. Um, you know, for two-way communication and two-way involvement. Cause like, you know, kind of, I, you know, like one of the things that we did early on back in, you know, my in G4 is, you know, we went from video call, from phone calls to, uh, you know, video calls to insisting if you're on a conference call, you have to turn your video on. Like that's a, a cultural norm in our company now. And it was in, in G4, it's like, look, you're, it, it's, you can't just be on the phone you know, and half participating, you've got to turn your video on. You got to be in front of the computer. You got to be engaged. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's because I think it's it 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 it's almost as good as being in the room. You know, uh, and uh, so I think it's uh, you know, I mean, you, you can of course look at all the downside of this technology. So I'm not naive to think this is going to like save the world, but I think it's uh, it's interesting. And you know, I, mean, I wouldn't trade being here and be able to look out at the mountains. Yeah. Uh, and I can take my dog out. He loves to play in the snow and I can, you know, be back here in front of the computer working on, um, you know, and uh, it's a four minute drive to the grocery store and, you know, kind of uh, it's, uh, you know, kind of, it's just easier. Right. Yeah. So how much of it is, do you think is going to be driven by folks that have been traditionally in technology hubs resettling maybe want the smaller town lifestyle versus the importance of investing in education and opportunities for people that have lived in these small towns their entire lives that now they're wondering you know big industry has gone what's going to happen to our city yeah well i mean i think we probably have to do you know kind of that right and i think it's probably you know kind of both but i think that uh um I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about training, right? Education, you know, kind of. Uh, I think we, you know, how we train people is is a giant challenge. I understand, um, but I think that uh, you know we want it. You, you probably need to attract people to some of these places. I think you know where you are in Utah, you have probably a, 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 you know some really interesting possibilities because a lot of these towns are in places that you know would be kind of cool to live, right? So. Um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's efforts to make these places, uh, great places to live that grow. And I think what's happening right now is first, it's the places that are, that people would live if they could, that are immediately. So it's places like yeah. Steamboat or, you know, I'm talking to a guy that I work with who's in Bend, Oregon, and they're now officially in a Zoom town in Bend, Oregon. I don't know what that means, but the, uh, Sounds uh, trendy. It's, uh, uh, you know, so I think it'll happen in those kind of places before it happens in, you know, someplace that used to be an oil mining town. Uh, but, um, you know, the possibility is there. And some of the towns outside of Steamboat that I was mentioning, you know, so there's little towns like Craig and, you know, a bunch of others that, you know, kind of it used to be just people live there who worked in Steamboat who couldn't afford to live in Steamboat, right? And, you know, you know, they're starting to be like, well, this is kind of a cool place too. And, you know, I think you'll have kind of more of that, um, 
you know, I hope so. And like, let's, let's face it, like Silicon Valley is a great example. Like when I first, you know, got into tech and I was going out to Silicon Valley, I loved it, right? It was great, right? When I was there doing the commuting though, a couple of years ago, it's like, get me the heck out of here. I mean, it's just become so crowded. You know, you get on 101, any time of day, it's traffic jam. You want to go to dinner, you know, 20 miles down the road with somebody, you know, you're like, it's an hour commute, and, you know, traffic. It's like, you know, again, get myself in trouble, but I'm sorry, the lifestyle isn't the way it used to be when, when Silicon Valley started, you know, kind of, it's, it's too crowded, right? Now, you know, I don't know what they're going to do about it, but, you know, kind of like, I'll take one of these smaller towns uh, and the lifestyle associated with it and the cost of living any day. And of course, you know, you see a lot of tech companies are like starting to think, well, gosh, my employees can live anywhere. You've seen some say, guess what? We're not ever going back to, if people want to live in the office, they can, you know, work in the office, but, you know, we see no reason to not allow them to be remote. And I think that the power of that, you know, lifestyle, right? For sure. It's going to be the draw. Yeah. I'm looking at the clock and we're quickly running out of time, but I do have one more question I want to make sure I get your, your thoughts on. Um, so w what have you been doing with your team? And um, sounds like you have a lot of experience to, to draw from, um, but it's something that a lot of companies are struggling with, with everyone being dispersed. What are you doing with your team to make sure that there is a sense of com camaraderie and togetherness and communication? Yeah. So, I mean, so it's really, I'd say there's two things that we do. I mean, one is all of our teams have a rhythm of meetings, right? So that we're there all together. And, you know, and, and like I said, we, you know, have video as part of every meeting. But the other thing that we've kind of recognized, and it happened organically, but now it's kind of the default, is the first 15 or 20 minutes of every meeting are actually not about the meeting at all. They're personal stuff, right? And, you know, how are you doing? What's going on over there? You know, we actually, so the stuff that would have happened in the water cooler, we've kind of built into the meeting rhythm. Um, and, uh, you know, so somebody will be sitting in their, like their, their daughter who's two years old will crawl into their lap. And then we all kind of have a chuckle about that. And we talk about the daughter, we maybe even talk to the daughter. Right. So, um, you know, we, we, we've kind of recognized that we have to, you know, cause, uh, what, what a big part of the office, you hear about the water cooler. I see you have a water cooler right behind you, by the way. Uh, and you know, that's, that's kind of cool, but the, uh, or no, that's your microphone I'm looking at. I think it looked right, this one or this one. Yeah. This one. The, the one in front. Right. Yeah, but, but, that's the, my machine. right. Yeah. Yeah. Even better. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but the, um, you know, that, that, that was uh, like the human aspect and we need the human aspect. Right. So that's what we've done is it's just become like, we spend 10 minutes just, you know, shooting this stuff about, how everybody's doing, what's going on, you know, like, did it snow there? Yeah, it snowed, you know, kind of, uh, you know, what's going on with your life kind of stuff, right? And that's become, I think it's really important, right? Because I don't think, you know, if the only interaction we have is over, like, is your deliverable ready, you know, then I think that remote work becomes a drag. Yeah, for sure. I, and I love that. And it's something that I've been talking about as well, because especially early on, you know, everyone was doing the fake backgrounds and going on mute every time their kids started screaming. I'm like, I want that. Like that just makes it human. Like right. just embrace that. And it's okay. Like we all have our kids at home and our dogs barking at the Amazon, bringing our food and like, let, let's just embrace that for what it is. Cause we miss that about just hanging out with, with people. So let's yeah. not kind of whitewash over that. So Awesome. Yeah, I think that's really cool. And I think that, you know, like we're still like, you know, the, the first time we can get everybody together, we're going to do it. You know, that's like that's going to happen. Right. But uh, but we're going to you know, we're we're not ever you know, that's not going to become the the only way we, we're not going to just all like, OK, we're going to all get in the, work in the office every day. We're going to yeah. this remote thing is going to happen. We're going to continue to make it work. Um, and I think we're all better for it. And by the way. The planet's better for not me for sure. getting on an airplane and burning jet fuel all the damn time. Darn yeah. time anyways, right? Jim swears in our podcast and we still haven't got an E yet, so we're okay. <laughs>
Um, yeah, no, for sure. Well, Jim, I'll let you finally talk if you want to wrap it up. We're kind of coming up on time, but and I know I haven't let you into the conversation, so I apologize. I just uh, I, I, uh, I, no I worries. Going. This one was uh, was a great one to to listen to. Um, and I think, yeah, yeah the, I still have some wicked lag here. So, um, <laughs> probably, probably a good thing. Um, so, uh, but no, I mean, th this has been awesome to, to listen to. I mean, it, it's a couple topics that we're incredibly passionate about. I mean, it feels like every couple podcast episodes, we loop back to the remote and the one thing Jason, you know, we've talked about before is we even have clients at this point who are reaching out to us. Um, like how do you guys make the remote thing work? Because they've just been thrust into it. So yeah. I, I love just hearing how, how, how everybody is, whether it, it, it's, it's a remote first perspective or just kind of be thrown into it, how everybody's dealing with it right now, because yeah, it's like, we're, we're getting asked frequently, like, how, how are you, how are you managing it? And people like I, I do, I tell people like Jason and I've never been in the same room together in five and a half years. I'm like, how do you make that happen? I'm like we make it happen. Yeah. You know, it, it, it works out very, very well. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. That's great. Um, I love to hear others. So, but, that long. So, but this has been an, an awesome conversation. I really appreciate you spending the time with us and, and, and joining us for a chat. I guess as we quick wrap up, um, if you want to share where people can find you, our listeners, if, if they are interested in reaching out, sure. uh, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, Agenity, of course, Agenity.com, right? So, I mean, our software is free to trial. So if you're kind of in the analytics space and you're trying to build models and you're using analytic databases, you know, give us a try, right? And if you like it, tell us and, you know, hopefully you'll decide to pay for it, right? Um, you know, if you want to reach out to me, I mean, I'm on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest way to reach me. Uh, I, you know, I try to be responsive and, you know, kind of I've been lucky. This is like my fifth time through, you know, kind of the world of early stage companies and, uh, there are a lot of people who have advised me and give me great advice. So, you know, kind of, I'm happy to interact with, with others. So, you know, that's, that's what I would say is, you know, check us out on Agenity, check me out on LinkedIn. And uh, if you find something useful, reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rick. It was an honor to have you join us and love the conversation. It, it, yeah. It, uh, likewise, right? Like fun conversation. And, you know, like I said, I'm glad to find others who are kind of doing this space and, uh, like, you know, throwing together an analytics by accident. And that's, that's the way it is, right? Yep, for sure. All right. Thanks, awesome. Jim. Thanks, guys. Right. Talk to you later. Okay.